Welcome to another wonderful speaker event hosted by Spokane Community College's Hagen Center for the Humanities. I want to start out with our land acknowledgement of where I'm coming to you from today, since we are virtual. I also invite you to look up and acknowledge the land that you are currently on. We are honored to acknowledge that the community colleges of Spokane and our main campuses for Spokane Falls and Spokane Community College are located on the traditional and sacred homelands of the Spokane tribe. We also provide services in a region that includes the traditional and sacred homelands of the confederated tribes of the Colville Reservation and the Kalispell tribe. We pay our respects to tribal elders, both past and present, as well as to all indigenous people today. The land, this land holds their cultural DNA, and we are honored and grateful to be here on their traditional lands. We give thanks to the legacy of the original people and their descendants, and pledge to honor their stewardship and values. It is with great pleasure that we bring to you this evening a conversation with a distinguished speaker. But first, some housekeeping things. We are streaming this conversation uh, on YouTube. And if you have questions and or comments you want to ask Alice, our speaker, you can type them in the chat and they will be sent directly to me and I can ask them on your behalf. This conversation is meant to be interactive. So we certainly welcome and invite you to type in some questions. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Alice Wong using she, her pronouns, is a disabled activist, writer, media maker, and consultant. She is the founder and director of the Disability Visibility Project, an online communi community dedicated to creating, sharing, and amplifying disability media and culture created in 2014. Alice is the editor of Disability Visibility, First Person Stories from the 21st Century, an anthology of essays by disabled people and disability visibility, 17 first, 17 first person stories for today, an adapted version for adults. Her debut memoir, Year of the Tiger, An Activist's Life, will be available on September 6th of this year, 2022, from Vintage Books. You can also find her on Twitter at SF Dire Wolf. Please help me welcome Alice Wong. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. Oh, Josh, thank you uh, so much for having me tonight. I also want to thank everyone at Spokane Community College, to the Haitian Center, everyone that's been here. Thank you, Bob, for putting this together. To everyone that's involved in making this if it happened, they just virtual events. Thank you just as much care and work as in person events. And I am very thankful that many universities and organizations are continually either hybrid methods or continually virtual planning, virtual events, especially as the pandemic is not over. I am not shocked, so I'm very thankful to be speaking with you today. Great. So we're going to have an opportunity to have a conversation, Alice, and people will be watching and hopefully asking their questions. Um, but I want to start out by, I read some of your material um, and some of your essays. Uh, and you talk about uh, representation in the media and how important it is for people with disabilities. Can you speak a little bit to that, the impact uh, it might have on, on people with disabilities and what representation means? Yeah, I think I want to you know, uh, preface this first by saying that, you know, when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, Representation is important, but it's almost the first step, right? It's one of many steps for real structural change, for real 
Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit up on a lot of topics around uh, <clears throat> feeling safe and heard and valued, um, which is very important. Um, you also talk about, in some of your writing, about uh, being in an ableism society. And um, would you identify the American society as ableism? Um, and um, how would you say, you know, what kind of privileges would folks maybe see around ableism um, that you had to work through or help others work through? Yeah, I would say, you know, since I am living in the United States and somebody born and raised in the Midwest, and now I'm in San Francisco, you know, I just think definitely best, best on society of the United States, but I think it also applies to a lot of other places. You know, I think ableism is yeah, and yeah, with capitalism and supremacy and you know really racism is to all of the states of oppression. Um, I'll just give a few examples. Um, you know, I'm a wheelchair user and I think a lot of people would use ability aid. All you have to do is ask what do you just maybe have a digital world without, without the door to 
reflect on two legs. If you'll notice that the world is our cities, our campuses, it was never built for us, never been built for this uh, choice of people, you know, and I think you know, it's very obvious, right? It's just, you see what the ribs are, you see where characters are, you can't forget that those uh, were met by really huge resistance before the 88, right? It's still nowadays, right? 30 years, almost 30 years, well, well over 30 years after the 88, there are still people who are deaf who have to like fights, the interpreters in hospitals, with the poor systems, there are still disabled students who still have to prove their disability, just to get services or accommodations. Uh, there's still disabled people in the workplace that are still you know, seen as a special treatment, right? If you guys you know, ask you for accommodations. So there's a lot of different examples of ableism where, you know, many times the, it's the overall idea you know, that the uh, disability is just somewhat less adorable, that's not something that is ever wanted, ever valuable, ever kind of, you know, not to say, it's not automatically a negative. And, you know, the flip side, it's really about the default. I think not the same people are using the default. They just see the way policies are structured, the way environments are structured, and I think the way our language and our culture gives a lot of kind of, shows a lot of fear, and basically a lot of hostility towards difference. Difference in a lot of different ways, right? Not just about the way people, their bodies are like, you know, it's really about there is a difference that differs from this, what we consider as this normative good, right? This, this you know, a lot of qualities that are culture is very much about, you know, to be deeply, it's about being successful, it's about to be healthy. Well, what are all those you know, values, you know, what's underlying them? Right? What is the power dynamics? And, you know, what does it say in our culture that? Let's say you cannot work. That means that you're less valuable than people that do work. But in this pandemic, you see such disparities in vaccine equity, and let's say just the health care, right? You can't deny that this is a function of the way our culture values certain people. Clearly, just includes indigenous people, people of color, working class people who are considered mental workers, older people, disabled people, immunocompromised people. That to me just shows how, you know, once you see ableism or just better understanding of it, you can't unsee it. Absolutely. I think you hit it right on once you see it, you can't see it. I also like the term, once you know better, you do better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, our, uh, you spoke to this, I think, a little bit, but in our at our college, at Spokane Community College, we just recently moved away from disability support services um, and changed our, the name of our center or space to Disability Access Services. Can you speak to the importance of maybe changing the language that we use, um, you know, about disability awareness versus disability acceptance or disability inclusion even? Um, the power of words, I think, is important. Isn't it interesting? I think it is because 
for some people, it's like, oh, what's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal. It's about freebie, right? It's about to be free these uh, concepts. And I think uh, eventually, this is why disability justice is a framework for understanding disability that's, I think, much more holistic. Yeah, just something that I would encourage uh, the people in the audience if you're not familiar with disability justice, you really do a kind of a deep dive if you any extra reward that's suddenly uh, if I could give you all extra credit right now, I would, but I can't, so I'm sorry. But uh, if there is something uh, you want to do, is to just you know, Google uh, Disability Justice and learn that it's a larger framework for understanding disability. And I think uh, you know, for the bookstore, I think there's still this idea that uh, it's a shift from if you're a disabled person that you are presumed to automatically are a service recipient, right? That you're in need of things versus a more dynamic understanding. You know, it's not just about people who have the resources, right? The gatekeepers, right? It's not just about people with the power who can give you things if you're worthy. Yeah, you know, access is constantly a very much an evolving thing. It is a collaborative thing, too, even though you know, institutions like universities, like college, like campus college, community colleges, and other, you know, secondary schools, you know, they definitely have much more of a Day, but I think uh, there's much more of a movement now to, to keep pushing. You know, to say, like, why do we have all of these hurdles in place? You know, why do we have such a scarcity mindset about access, right? I think, uh, you know, what if we lived in a world where people didn't have to work that hard to get the bare minimum? You know, what if we lived in a world where everyone had the tools and the supports they did to be their full selves. Don't we all deserve that? Don't we all? You know, shouldn't we do that without having to have a huge paper trail proving our medical conditions, a diagnosis, or a testing just to be a student? You know, I think, or if you're staff or faculty as much as, right? Just, you know, wouldn't it be great if there wasn't a stigma around asking for help? You know, that's the kind of world I need me to create. As, you know, I mentioned this about justice, you know, it's, um, one of the principles is the idea of interdependence, you know, it's a sense that, you know, it's not a weakness to ask for help. Yeah, we're all capable of giving and receiving help. And that we're actually stronger than we have to collect when we work collectively. And there's power to collective collectivity. You know, I think another thing, especially you got student activists, right? I think what's really exciting is that you see all kinds of organizing happening. Across campuses, now, especially in the last you know, two to five years, especially with Black Lives Matter, and I think learning about the you know, queer labor issues facing you know, adjuncts and TAs and you know, people who work on campus, right? Like, there needs to be more solidarity and more cross movement or organizing. You know, it's in the best interest of students. It's also in the best interest of faculty and staff. And I think that's the kind of future where we should really be structured together. And that to me is kind of what is the difference, right? It's about access. It's not about awareness because awareness can only go so far. You have to actually take action. 
チアテスピチャー、チアフタ、シュワ、チラウシュワペイ、グリーズルヴルウェイス、ユジュシュワ、プレイフォーユーフェイツ、イビジュースタオーバー。She says something, right? Like, God, that is really thoughtful. And let me tell you why. You know, people should do things in bigger, small ways to show up for each other. I think that's part of the overall shift that I'm really excited to see. You know, also, I don't know about Spokane, but I do a lot of other schools. There's、uh, students who are you know, establishing disability cultural centers. That to me is also very exciting because it's、uh, you know, led and centered by disabled people. It is not this office that's part of you know, a broader kind of mandate by the university to provide、uh, services. To work on compliance, right? Because compliance is one thing, but that's not exactly access. It's not exactly equity. It is really not justice at all, right? So I think we have to aim higher, right? I think that's the objective beyond compliance, the objective beyond the bare essentials. Wow. I just need to.、Uh... Re acknowledge the term disability justice because it's such a big piece.、Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've, you've devoted a lot of your life to disability activism.、Um, what are some things, you know, you kind of mentioned a lot of student involvement. What are some things that you've seen come out as a positive outcome from your activism? Through the book, through your writing? Yeah, I think,、uh, especially I think storytelling has been kind of one of my preferred forms of activism. You know, I think there's all kinds of ways of being an activist. Like, you don't have to be on the streets, you, know, you don't have to hold rallies. That's,、uh, you don't have to go knocking on doors. That's you know, one part of it that might be. Some of the things that most people associate you know, with activism, but everybody should be an activist. You, know, you don't need to kind of you know, have any sort of training or just kind of get messy. You can、uh, get to things, smash around. You know,、uh, there's no rules. And I think that's one of the messages I want to share because you know, most of my work has been. There's storytelling, and it's also been there's social media. You know, I use hashtags. And I think there's still weird resistance towards that's not real activism, right? But like, who would you to judge, right? Like, this is, I see it actually, you know, I'm a really basic product for young people, three entire movements. Their couch from their bed because they can't leave their homes. So it's amazing what we can do with a lot of creativity and technology and community, right? I think this is you know, we're doing much stronger together. And、uh, I think that's part of storytelling, too, is you know, just, it also relates to representation. It's about building power, it's about building cultural power. I just share it that we're not like a monolith. There's such a diversity of both the disabled experience. There's so much more than just one story or one kind of stereotype of disability. There's such a Genius kind of community. I think that's really important too, to kind of highlight that and you know, push it forward that the,、uh, the wisdom and truth from our lives really needs to be shared. And hopefully, people will get something out of it. And,、uh, something. And、uh, 
we get kind of upset and they galvanize, they just feel something, they don't feel something. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> um, one thing that definitely spoke to me about that is um, the how people show up as activists. Um, and we often think of people in the forefront, but we all have a, a different way of showing the activism. Mm -hmm. You're right. I, I I I don't show up at rallies often, but boy, my activism is is being able to have participants like yourself, speakers, mm -hmm. share their insight with with our community, with our mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. um, so that's huge. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, what recommendations do you have for maybe our community members listening in, our staff, or faculty that work with? people with disabilities, what kind of recommendations do you have for them? Well, I would say, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, try not to have lower expectations, to be honest. You know, a lot of my experiences uh, in graduate education all the way up to with that degree school, uh, just a bunch of my encounters with administrators and teachers for lowered expectations. You know, I think that's what was pretty painful and uh, enraging as a student. You know, I didn't feel understood or valued. I think that would be a very simple you know, don't lower your expectations. Don't don't be don't make any judgments about them. Uh, you can also be more proactive about access, right? Not just focusing on disabled students, right? Just like have like your policies up up front. Let's say if you're a teacher, put these put access notes in your syllabi. You know, don't make fun or disparage students. You need extra time. Right, these are really simple things to register your messages that you give a shit, you know? So they just try to give a shit about others. They understand, especially the last, you know, two plus years, people are grieving, people are definitely having mental health stuff, trauma, everybody's going through a lot. And I think the way we've always done things, whether it's at the you know, school level or any other workplace, we just kind of loosen things up. You know, give each other grace. Uh, maybe rethink why so we have certain structures or dorms in place, ask which what is the place so we can make it expansive, more flexible, you know, I really hope if we come out of this pandemic, if it would, that we do learn from these lessons, you know, what are some ways to really meet people where they are. And I think, you know, with this, uh, it is also related to ableism, right? It's for so long, disabled students, faculty staff, stu disabled students, faculty and staff have often advocated for remote learning, for remote work. And none of that was like, it had to be a huge battle, right? For access to online curricula. But all of a sudden, it took this major epidemic, just global events for institutions to have to change. And I really hope that as things, you know, slowly return to normal, that leadership will also see the value in continuing many of these things. Because they really do help reach more people. For example, I don't travel. So, you know, if Spokane Community College invited me, 
But you know, if there's like, if there weren't virtual programs like this, I wouldn't be able to participate. So, did you about all the different people? Did you get reach through all types of methods? And I think that's that's the future, right? Just any people where they are, but using as many big boats as possible. They don't go back. They don't go back to the way the way things used to be. Because they work great for a lot of people to be good with, to be honest. Alice, you're really dropping some knowledge on us here tonight. Uh, because yes, absolutely. I think if we look at silver linings, you know, a global pandemic, it's that we had to pivot and and do it well. And we've learned. And like you said, there's no going back. This is, you know, how we need to move forward and into the future. It's being flexible, giving each other grace and um. And, and being accessible in more ways than one. And it's now these virtual Hagen Center speakers have been amazing now, now that we're we, I have I have a good news and it's really so cool that the you know Hagen Center embraces that. And I think it's such an opportunity too. I think that's that's a thing that I want to emphasize, right? That access creates new opportunities. And that it also is an opportunity to collaborate and to be creative. And I think that's the overarching goal of the huge benefit, right, of access. Everything about access, once we open things up, you know, good things happen. Good things happen. We do have access. And I think that's, again, there's this really weird, I think, kind of, conventional wisdom or just this impulse within institutions that there's this woodwork effect. Oh, you know, students, you know, you can only ask, you know, just there's limits to what we can offer. For sometimes the fear of too many people requesting these things. You know, there's a sense of like we can only do so much, we can only offer so much, but Look what happened during the pandemic, right? With so many other times, there were requests for virtual conferences. There were requests for remote learning, but suddenly, to be honest, not disabled people were inconvenienced and forced to do it, right? So I think, you know, there's something to be think thought about in terms of there are the resources. There just isn't the political will to make these things happen. Right. And that's what we think about access is a very limited way as these things that are seen as extra or seen as something we have to do or seen as a burden. Right. If we don't think about it as an opportunity, that's the way to think about it. Right. Like that's the. This is where I would love to see leadership and you know everybody think about persons in a different way. Uh, for example, a friend of mine, her name is Bea Bickus, M I A M I A G U S. You know, she gave a keto talk uh, in 2018. And she has this line that said, Access is a form of love. It's like, wow, like this is, you know, I think, really revolutionary in a lot of ways. Yes, I think for a lot of people, especially not disabled people, you know, access, they think of, oh, it's like, you know, a law, it's a rule, it's, you know, regulation, it's a checklist. It's a lot more than that. I think disabled people do that intimately. Yeah, access is a lot more than that. It's, it's a lot of um, things that we give to one another, that we share. And, uh, it's infinite. It's not finite. 
I think that's the mindset I would like to see adopted everywhere. Thank you for that. Yes, um, access is a form of love. I love that. Um, <clears throat> in your book, uh, some parts of the book, you talk about role models. Can you enlighten us maybe on some of your own role models? And how? I would say that definitely people that are in the anthologies, the writers that are there, they're people that I admire. Uh, so for anybody that's not familiar with visibility, visibility anthology, uh, the first piece in there is by Harriet McBride Johnson. Harriet is no longer with us in this world. I consider her an ancestor. She's a brilliant lawyer and a really funny fighter. But she is somebody that I only met once when she came to uh, use the birthday for both of us. I was just, you know, in the audience, just, you know, she was uh, hard to my eyes, like emoji. Uh, so, you know, just uh, listening to her and feeling so seen and just so thankful that she's in the world. Her essay was something that when it first came out, I was like, this is something so powerful. And it's something that I really want to more people to read. So anyways, you know, she shows just by her writing and in her writing about her interactions with people, just different ways to be. Friends. Like we talked about earlier about giving people trace. She shows a try to about this about a trace with somebody who believes that disabled people should not exist. You know, she went head up against a philosopher who's basically a eugenicist. And she still treated him as a human. You know, she was a full hate. And that to me is interesting. I think uh, the way she wrote her essay really giving, I think, a reader a glimpse of what it's like to be disabled in a not disabled world, just like the things that I do with every day. And she wrote it so brilliantly that I really do hope most people, more people read it. And she also has books. Uh, she wrote at least two books, so I really do recommend people uh, to look into her work. She's a wonderful person and somebody I consider their own personal hero. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit because uh, I read online that people often ask about disability rights, disability activism, but not a whole lot of people ask you what your outside of that interests are. Okay. Tell us more about you. Tell us what interests you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> if we had a little uh, talk about your, your uh, bio and which one to read <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but tell yeah, us about your interests outside of disability oh activity. sure oh sure like that you know again i i hope that people say you know to realize that you know i have i have to take multitudes just like we all do right it's not just about the work right if i don't i think the work gives me joy but uh you know i have lots of other interests and i think uh before our event, we had a, we all were on the zoo, getting ready. And, you know, uh, one of the people was moderating right up behind the seats, you know, making sure everything goes smoothly. I had a portrait of a cat behind his office. And I was like, I'd like to know more about this cat. So I liked cats. I liked cheesecake. I like to watch cartoons. I watch a lot of TV. I love Star Trek. So there's a lot of things. Oh, I love fried foods. I love french fries. I love tempura. 
I love all the bows and the butts. I love dip soup. So I think uh, there's a lot of joy. It means I try to treat myself. I'm a believer in ice cream. I try to eat a stupid day. You know, that's my yoga. You know, I'm sure I like people love to, you know, exercise, but ice cream is my yoga. So these are the things that I enjoy. And I do love that, you know, for any of the summer, just getting a little warmer. I love just sitting outside and just feeling the warmth of the sun. Very simple things that I think uh, you know, give me pleasure a bit to all of this stuff in the world. That's how important. You, how about you? What gives you pleasure? <laughs> That's important. I think one of my uh, guilty pleasures is to uh, read fictional <laughs> books. Um, Anything trashy? Anything trashy? Ah! <laughs> There's no shame. There's no guilt. <laughs> there is no guilt to what we read. It's just okay? Our no guilt. guilt. No guilt. That's true. I think um, it's important sometimes to take ourselves, like you mentioned, out of the current state of the world or the current state of our environment and be able to. And I, I love that about reading. Uh, is to be able to escape into a different reality. Um, and so that's it's important for me. Speaking of reading, um, you know, we've got a few, you know, about 15 more minutes left on our conversation. So for those watching, feel free to put in some questions in the chat. We'd love to ask Alice anything that you... Uh, Don't have. be shy. Don't yeah. be shy. <laughs> this says, is your time. It's your time. Yeah, so. I am here for you, Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alice. I do want to, uh, my prepared questions, I want to ask you about your new book coming out. Tell us more. What can we expect in this? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, so after the anthology came out in 2020, you know, I thought to myself, okay, uh, you know, I want to keep the momentum. Maybe I might have another chance to get a book deal. You know, let's see what I can come up with. And you know, instead of doing do another anthology, just it should have been easily a follow-up anthology. You know, I thought, oh, you know, maybe there's a it's a good time to look back at my work and do my story this time. But you know, that's it about creating space, I say. The joy to share other people's stories. It's also completely okay to center yourself every once in a while. So, you know, I wrote this memoir, so I share the title. It's going to be out September 6th. And it really delves into kind of the things I talked about, have my love of cats. So much about food, a lot about Chinese culture, you know, a lot about pop culture. Just, just you know, I try to not to, I try to make it as fun as possible. I'm not to do this uh, as a super serious memoir. You know, I have to just squeeze every drop of fun that I can. So. Really people of our kids. There's a lot of cats in there. So, uh, you know, if you're not a cat person, sorry, not sorry. But uh, hopefully you'll read it anyway. But I'm not sorry. I love, love, love that you're unapologetically and authentically yourself, Alice. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's your side, friends. It's a lot of work to get to that place. And I'm still working on it. You know, I'm still 100%, you know, uh, there. I don't think anybody's ever there. Right. I think it's all about this 
process avoid this just evolve it you know i think that's to me the most important thing about when it's getting older or wiser but so your book is coming out through vantage publishing house right vantage uh, vintage vintage sorry vintage okay. books yep this is a publisher as an anthology awesome um, you also talk about, um, in some of the articles I've read, about kind of calling to people to create what is missing. And one of the things missing is publish houses by by and for disabled people. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be something? Uh, you know, I think we talked about disability representation earlier. And again, you know, it's the people who make decisions. Right, it's an executive producer for tour studio that gets to develop a film. You know, who should be the director? Who should be the cast? And the same for books, right? I think, uh, you know, books are still really important in this day and age. They can take us to so many places, right? Escapism. But also, you know, we we'll just try to expand our minds. And I would love to see more diverse people in publishing. That there also includes disabled people. That I think of uh, like a lot of uh, a lot of you know, professions. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So many places are still overwhelmingly white and I think you know it's time for a change and it's great to see you know other presses or imprints that are dedicated to books by let's say uh, uh, indigenous people or black people or Asian Americans and I think this has really been a long time to we just need more of that and there are I think small independent presses they're doing a lot of great work too. And I think we need all of that, right? Small and the middle press, the, uh, the big publishers, you know, we need diversity everywhere. Absolutely. All right, we got a question from the audience um, about giving advice, advocating for oneself. You kind of mentioned this earlier in the conversation, but what advice do you have for students? maybe who have disabilities, mm -hmm. um, vis both uh, visual and non-visual disabilities and advocating for themselves. I would say first, you know, I know that it's hard, right? It's hard. It can be scary. Mm -hmm. And you don't go to the, like, it could be a risk, right? So you know, advocate for yourself. Sometimes it starts with knowing in your gut whether something is right or wrong. You know, sometimes you have to really feel this overwhelming sense of like something is not right, some horrible stuff, or that there's a real serious issue. So part of it is you, yourself, recognizing that something is something needs to be said something needs to be done uh, sometimes I think actually for yourself you also you can get the support of like close friends you know people that you trust to say like you know hey I just want to put this by you you know I was with you like what do you think about this here's the situation I have to talk to you this person tomorrow, you know, here's what I'm thinking about saying. Sometimes I write notes, you know, if I'm really like, if I'm super enraged about something, which I do get enraged for quite a while, quite often, and that's okay too. You know, I try to organize my thoughts, you know, make sure that I say the points that I really want to say, you know, give a lot of good reasons. You know, I try to make up 
to bake a case, right? To bake a case for myself or for the situation. So sometimes you're thinking ahead, but sometimes when you're thinking of the moment, it's okay to be emotional. You know, it's okay to be kind of like, you know, say like, you know, WTF, like, you know, just WTF, right? And, you know, you also get other people involved too, right? You can have friends or other people that have your back. Do you know, also support you? Do you also say, like, hey, do you, like, you know, go with me to this? Or can I talk to you afterwards? Or did you review this thing for me? So I think sometimes technology there to be scary, but also knowing that you don't have to do this alone. Even if you're advocating for yourself, right? That you don't have to go through it alone. And that you're definitely not the only one going through this. Even though you feel like it, I can guarantee you, you're not the only one. I think that's how oppression works. But they want you to feel like you're the only one. They want you to feel like you can't do to other people. That's how you know, people try to, they try to divide people, right? That's how, that's what they want to do, pit groups against each other. And I think that's the way of pressure works sometimes. So understanding that it's a part of a larger structure too. So yeah, I hope that helps, but you know, I think you're definitely not the only one to do this. Very profound. Um, thank you. Uh, we've got another question from one of our viewers. Um, they might have missed it from the beginning, so you can bring up the, your friend's name again. But what works of literature would you recommend to folks right now? Oh, this is great. I love it. Works of literature. Well, actually, I have to give a shout out to two authors. They have thought for sure books, even though literature is great. Um, actually, I have a deuce letter, which I'll share with um, you all later on. I'm going to sit up late, but it's a deuce letter where I do book giveaways of liter literature by deaf and disabled people. So you find a lot of great literature um, this year and last year. But this letter is called Disability. Disability. It's on Substack. S U B S T A C K. It's a Substack newsletter. If you want to subscribe, you see all of my literature recommendations. But before we leave, huh, there are two exciting books coming out this fall. Yeah, it feels like to me like to plus my memoir. It's almost like this cosmic triumvirate of awesomeness. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It's like I'm, I'm so stoked for these books. Um, so the first one is called The Future is Disabled by Leah Lashby, Yepsta Sibarasita. So, Via is one of the contributors by anthology. So, you can find out more about Via's work there, but also look at the book. The future is disabled. Here we have the Arsenal Pulp Press. Another book that is by actually um, a academic. University of Wisconsin is by Dr. Sammy Schultz. It is called Black Disability Politics. I am so excited. This is the book that the world needs. So this is, these two books I am just kidding. I'm just kidding. Sammy's book, Black is 
my politics is coming out from Duke University Press, I believe. So, yeah, so look up the CMB over here. You pre order or you can order your library this fall. Thank you for sharing uh, that and uh, the blog. I think that's amazing and that's super fun that people can get an opportunity to get some free books or at least even just recommendations. Yeah, there's a lot of good work to be out. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're kind of nearing the hour here, so I just want to do one last call. If there's any last minute questions that folks have, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll ask them right away. Um, but I just really do want to appreciate, Alice, the time that you've spent with us this evening and just sharing from your perspective and your experiences um, and enlightened us with a lot of knowledge, a lot of activism, a way forward into the future. Um, and then a little bit more about you. That was really fun. I really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit better. Thank you. And I hope that um, you know, people, as they, you know, as the summer comes around, just you know, try to take care of yourselves, rest, you know, just try to, you know, take a pause. You know, I think we all deserve rest, we all deserve care. Yeah, we should really just try to make the most of our time on this earth. You're so kind to us. I think I've got a, someone with a question They just might be typing it in. Um, in the sure. chat. Sure, well, that's um, question. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other uh, last parting words for folks while we wait for this question to come up? Just say, meow, meow. <laughs> meow, that's it. it. No, yeah, so that's about it. Just meow, meow. That's, I'm getting very silly because, you know what, activism should be silly, so. Thank you. I think the question came through. Uh, so the question is, I have a disability. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's appropriate to ask other disabled people what theirs is? You know, I think it really depends on the context. If you just randomly met somebody, maybe hold up a bit, you know, just see how they identify, see how they talk about themselves. It, it feels like they're comfortable for who they are. Maybe you can ask, but I, I tend to kind of wait until I do support. And, uh, you know, I, ju I just try to let the other person take the lead. You know, uh, I have a lot of friends who are disabled, but I don't know the particulars about their disability. But, you know, I think that to me it didn't really, it wasn't something I was curious about. But if I was curious, you know, I think I would get to a level where we're both comfortable with each other, where I feel it's okay to ask. But I think that is really uh, depending on the situation. And sometimes you'll see somebody at a party, you know, you might kind of like, I don't have that chair, you have that chair? Like, sometimes as a total strangers, you do feel an instant tension. And it does happen with people with both a parent and daughter parent disabilities, right? So I think sometimes it just, sometimes you have to do chairs, but also respect, however, the person responds, right? If it sounds like they don't want to talk about it, you know, it's like, okay, no problem. But just, you know, be respectful. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's all about kind of the relationship you have with, with other individuals. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a comment from the audience. Uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, it says, meow, meow. Love it. Thank you very much. Meow, meow, meow. <laughs> <laughs> they say thank you for the interview and thank you so much Alice for spending the last hour with us we really do appreciate it the fact that you're able to do this 
over virtual streaming services for the college and bring your perspective and, and help students find that representation matters, their role models through your anthologies and through your own experience. I hope that folks enjoyed this evening with us. Um, and Thank you, Diablo. I just had a lovely time talking with you. I feel like good things happen when people get together. I also want to thank the captioners and our interpreters and everyone who has made this event possible. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to our interpreters and our captioner. <laughs>